All right. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. All right, so what is the sequencing singularity? Well, firstly, the, si the singularity is a concept from science fiction, um, from von Neumann and Ray Kurzweil, where uh, uh, intelligence, uh, computer intelligence suddenly sort of acquires hyper-exponential growth and uh, uh, results in a huge uh, new computer that eventually enslaves and kills us all. But don't worry about that, it's not for a few years. Um, the sequencing singularity is what I'm going to talk about today. And that's a much more pleasant prospect. And the idea here is, can we replace um, a whole bunch of traditional assays in clinical microbiology and in diagnostics and in epidemiology and public health with a single assay, sequencing? Um, and is that going to have a profound effect on our ability to uh, diagnose infectious diseases um, and track their spread? And I obviously believe that it will. And just in support of that, our uh, some of the Im information we can get from genome sequences uh, are listed here. You know, important things like uh, where does an outbreak come from? Uh, um, do we have an outbreak or is this a pseudo outbreak or, or unlinked cases? How, do, uh, how does the host respond to infection? And critically, how do pathogen genomes respond to treatment? And clearly, antimicrobial resistance is a huge uh, pressing concern at the moment. And, and that includes the idea of diagnostics. And, and I really do believe that this is not that far away, um, the idea that we might be able to um, replace whole swathes of clinical microbiology testing uh, with sequencing. And in the talk, I'm really going to talk about um, how, how far along that path we are and, and where, where are the kind of big gaps that we need to address, whether that's in the lab or bioinformatically or socially. So I'm going to remind the audience of the power of doing sequencing uh, for outbreaks uh, and epidemics. And I'm going to return to a subject that you may have seen me talk about already. But uh, I do think this is a, a critically important piece of work, uh, which was how uh, we managed to investigate chains of transmission uh, during the Ebola epidemic from 2013 uh, to 2016. You may recall that we were able to establish a uh, um, remote sequencing lab in Guinea, um, packed up in a, what we call a, a lab in a suitcase. Um, and um, Josh Quick, uh, who isn't here today, I should just, a little aside on Josh, Josh wanted to be here today. Uh, Josh works as a PhD student in my lab, but he had to stay home and finish his thesis, which he's now finished. So well done, Josh. Um, I just want to be clear, that doesn't mean he's on the job market, okay? <laughs> like, seriously. Okay. Um, <laughs> Josh did much of the lab work that I'm going to present today. So Josh, working with Miles Carroll uh, for Public Health England, working with local Guinean scientists, as Raymond pictured here, uh, working with uh, um, the, the Guinean Ministry of Health. We managed to establish v v several genome centers. This is one of our last genome centers in, in Nongo, uh, in Guinea, in order to provide real-time sequencing um, in support of, of the epidemic response. And what I mean by real-time, I mean genuine real-time. Um, many cases sequenced, pathogen genomes sequenced within two days of the patient sample being, diagn uh, patient being diagnosed uh, by QRT-PCR, um, and, and, and uh, in at least 50% cases uh, within, a, within a week, and very high coverage of the outbreak. Um, over 50% of the cases from, from May 2015 were sequenced. And I think that was an important bit of work. Um, and this slide just shows some of the findings that were unexpected that came out of that genomic analysis and also critically the genome data sharing uh, between us, other groups, uh, Ian Getfellow's group in Cambridge who was doing portable sequencing um, 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 in Sierra Leone. And we identified important information that was fed back to the epidemic response. For example, Ebola was frequently uh, moving between countries. We showed several uh, uh, clear examples of cross-border transmissions between Guinea and Sierra Leone by integrating with Ian's data. Looking at links between cases, really important in prioritizing um, the public health response. Where are chains of transmission? Where are they coming from? Are we missing chains of transmission? Where do we need to prioritize uh, um, response? And, and many cases of detecting links between cases that couldn't be put together with the conventional epidemiological uh, questionnaires and case, and case um, tracking. 
Um, we were able to, later on in the, in the epidemic where we had flare-ups, um, new cases that seemingly came out of nowhere, we were able to identify that these weren't, as had been um, suggested, new introductions from animal reservoirs. These were uh, actual transmissions from survivors. Survivors turned out to be able to be infected with Ebola and cause transmission uh, much longer than we expected, and in one case that we uh, uh, helped with the genomic investigation with, uh, over 500 days from uh, contracting Ebola and surviving uh, to a new transmission, so new information about Ebola biology. And I've shown this video before, I'm going to show it again. Um, this is what happens if you take 1,600 Ebola virus genomes, we generated about 180 in total, uh, and you take the, the total corpus of genome data, uh, you take the time and the place uh, associated with the sample, and you try and reconstruct Ebola transmission throughout West Africa. Hopefully what you see is how many transmission events uh, are occurring and how, how, how often uh, Ebola is moving very long distances, either within country or between country. Uh, just the case there, uh, going up to Boke Prefecture on the border of, Sierra, of, of, of Guinea-Bissau. And you know, this, is our, this is an understanding that we can get from the genome sequences if we can collect those genome sequences uh, quickly enough. And that's the kind of information we want, we need to be able to provide into epidemic and outbreak response uh, in real time. And we think that that's important. Um, but I want to just you know, draw your attention to the fact that, that the work that we, we got involved with was too late, much too late. We, we deployed um, um, uh, into Guinea in uh, 2015, around April time. Um, and that's after the, the, the peak of the epidemic curve um, um, in, in October 2014. And, and quite clearly, that's, that's you know, too late. It took a long time to diagnose uh, Ebola. It took about three months to get a, a confirmed diagnosis here. Um, and and you know, clearly, the opportunity to, in, to incorporate this information about transmission would have been much better had um, earlier on. So the question is, can we deploy this kind of technology now onto the leading edge of outbreaks? And, and can we kind of prove Peter Peel right, where he says Out outbreaks are inevitable. We're always going to have new outbreaks from po populations like animal spillovers. But we don't need to have epidemics. We certainly don't need to have pandemics. And so really, the next part of the talk is to, is to outline how um, we're trying to tackle this problem, but also to outline some of the issues um, that, that we face. So coming right hot on the heels of the Ebola epidemic, uh, was Zika. Um, Zika had been uh, around since the 50s, but, but, but Zika was, was thrust into the public's uh, consciousness associated with a uh, high rate of microcephaly uh, in newborns. And the WHA declared this a public health emergency of international concern in spring 2016, just as we were coming off the end of the Ebola project. And we thought, well, this is, a, this is an obvious thing to do genomic, genomic surveillance on. Um, why don't we just... Um, um, hook up with some Brazilian collaborators, uh, why don't we get a bus, um, why don't we drive around Brazil, um, and, you know, Top Gear style, um, without the sort of misogyny and, or you know, Jeremy Clarkson, um, actually do some genome sequencing of, of, of Zika. It all seems so simple. So the idea was to uh, start in Natal. Um, this, is, this is where um, you have the, the most number of cases of microcephaly and, and the largest uh, uh, populations of Aedes aegypti uh, mosquitoes drive from Natal down to Salvador, uh, collecting mosquitoes, working with the public health labs, sequencing genomes, and trying to understand what's going on uh, in America. And we had the idea we'd do 750 genomes on the trip. Turned out to be hopelessly naive as a concept, because unlike Ebola, Zika has vanishingly low titers of, uh, of, of numbers of viruses uh, in clinical samples. And this is... Um, uh, some, some uh, data from Christian Anderson's group showing what happens if you try and do uh, metagenomics on Zika with, uh, with MySeq in this case. And you can see these cycle threshold numbers, the number of uh, PCR cycles you need to get a positive diagnosis are quite high, which means uh, the number of genome equivalents in a microliter 
uh, are very low, tens of copies, and that means when you put them on a kind of untargeted metagenomics approach on a MySeq, you get really a vanishingly small number of reads, not really enough uh, to reconstruct genomes and do uh, phylogenetics on. And this really shows one of the problems with how we get to our sequencing singularity. Some, some uh, organisms and some pathogens don't, don't behave nicely for our assay. To address this, we came up with a, a new uh, um, um, protocol, which uh, again relied on, P on PCR, tiling PCR. You just amplify bits of the genome uh, um, um, in pieces, um, but critically trying to optimize those PCR primers to uh, encourage amplification from even very small numbers of starting uh, genome copies. And this worked very well. This was uh, devised by Josh and it's, uh, it's published now. And uh, we have various schemes that are now available for Zika, other arboviruses, and it's actually in, in heavy use by the community, generating schemes for all sorts of different uh, interesting uh, pathogens. So, so there is a way of rapidly enriching via PCR uh, using um, this kind of technique. Applied to Zika, it did a pretty good job, didn't do an amazing job. This is the kind of coverage that we get across genomes for the genomes that we generated uh, during the Zebra project. Uh, and you can see we get you know, mainly complete, but kind of patch, slightly patchy uh, looking uh, genomes. And the, the percentage coverage of that genome is very uh, related to that CT value and the number of starting viruses. So once you get up to about CT of 38, 39, it really becomes impossible uh, to, to actually get genome sequences. Um, but putting all this information together, we were struck and we, we combined our data with, with several other groups who were looking at um, other parts of the Americas and looking at Zika in other parts of the Americas. And we managed to generate uh, this, this time tree. So we've got time here on, on the y-axis. And this vertical line is important. Uh, this horizontal line is important. That tells us the first clinical diagnosis of Zika um, in Brazil. And that was uh, around uh, May 2015. The phylogenetic reconstruction tells you um, that there was a huge amount of circulating diversity in the Americas uh, uh, long before that first clinical diagnosis. Um, and we think that the introduction of Zika into the Americas was around this uh, time point um, A, as early as uh, maybe August um, uh, 2013. And various other studies have uh, corroborated this, this idea. And what this means is that uh, and this is a true outside Brazil and in Central America and Caribbean. Uh, these arrows are the first clinical diagnosis in those respective locations. And this is our most likely um, time of introduction into those areas. So our surveillance is not working very well. We are not able to pick up Zika uh, um, a full a year in most cases uh, before it's actually spread and caused um, probably tens of thousands, if not more, uh, cases. So something's going wrong in our ability to do surveillance. Okay, so our idea is, can we move sequencing into the clinic? And we uh, um, recently I, I wrote a review with um, Jennifer Gardy uh, from BCCDC, kind of, and you know, if you're interested in this topic, have a look at the review, because the idea is, uh, is this idea. Can we have sequencing as a standard assay um, that, that we can use um, for doing surveillance. And we identified a number of issues that, that need to be addressed if you're going to have mobile sequencing, uh, fieldable sequencing for untargeted surveillance of, of viruses and pathogens. And I'm going to talk about a few of our efforts to try and address some of these gaps. Obviously, Nanopore themselves are looking into these issues about cost and sequence of performance, as Gordon already said. And the Flongal chip is obviously an important thing in terms of cost. We're very interested in this issue of informatics, um, getting, getting pipelines working correctly, getting them so they can be used by non-bioinformaticians in the field, and also producing actionable information visualization tools so we can actually communicate what these uh, quite complex phylogenet phylogenetic information actually means, uh, as well as looking into the laboratory side about how we can remove things like contamination and improve enrichment. So uh, briefly, our kind of start in terms of the informatics challenge is to try and put the quite complicated pipeline that we used for calling out variants uh, from nanopore data, which still relies on using the signal level information. So we, we absolutely depend on uh, Jared Simpson's nanopolish 
um, software in order to call out SNPs reliably. And we only tend to call out SNPs. We don't call out indels at the moment. And uh, we have this working as a Docker container, which you can run on a laptop or on a server, which packages up this information and makes it reasonably easy to generate a consensus sequence from a set of FAST5 files. Um, Jackie uh, goes to Jesus, uh, came with us on the Zika trip, and um, afterwards she got a, a fellowship to come uh, and work in Birmingham. She's been with us for the last five months, and she's been working on improving the um, sequencing library preparation. And, and we're actually very, very excited about this. There's some new data. Um, this is the idea that is used by the Rapid 16S kit. So the idea of doing, um, you get rid of the ligation steps and you replace it with a click chemistry. So adapters, sequencing adapters go on um, uh, by click chemistry. Um, and you can apply this to a specific assay. So in this case, we've taken the existing Zika multiplex scheme, but we've modified it to put tails onto the PCR so that we can then um, add tails that, that can then have the barcodes added to them, and then the, the rapid 1D adapters click on. Um, that saves some time. So this is the old, the old method on the left. Um, we think it's about eight hours in total. So it really tends to be used over two days. Um, and about three and a half hours of hands-on time. And the new method really still depends a little bit on how much virus you're, you're, you're having your sample. But at best, probably on a high titer sample, we might be able to get down to about four hours and, and 15 minutes. But critically, much less hands-on time and, and, and fewer enzymes. You get rid of the ligase, get rid of the, the, um, the, the end repair, and remove three cleanups. So it significantly reduces um, the effort. And it also means we're now compatible with the PCR barcoding kit, so we can have 96 samples um, on a flow cell. And in theory, all of this is available now in lyophilizable form. We haven't tried that yet. Um, but if we can have completely dried reagents, that's really going to help with shipping um, um, reagents out into the field. Just to show you that the rapid protocol and the standard ligation protocol give materially quite similar uh, um, um, coverage plots. This is kind of uh, normalized Amplicon data. And these are the kind of, um, for putting, in five, putting in four samples, including a negative control, these are the kind of um, rates of recovery. Not, not amazing, but um, good enough for this kind of work. So we're getting to a system. The idea now would be to put in a whole bunch of arboviruses into the single assay, not just Zika, but put in chikungunya, dengue, uh, Oropush virus, Myinga virus, all the, all the interesting uh, new viruses that, that we might worry about into a single um, enrichment assay. And that's going to work, I think, quite well if we're doing targeted um, uh, genome uh, surveillance. But we don't really want to do chart targeted sequence, uh, genome surveillance. We want to do untargeted uh, genome surveillance. But it's very difficult. Part of the problem is that clinical samples are often low biomass. Uh, something like a, a, a CSF sample is quite low biomass, for example. A blood sample is high biomass, but it's almost predominantly uh, uh, human uh, white cells and, and therefore human DNA. And so at the moment, we still pragmatically need to enrich in order to get genomes out. But you know, there are many ideas about manipulation of that starting sample in terms of depleting human cells, depleting human DNA, enriching pathogens, whether that's Bates or Cas9. And, and it may be that those are important. But as you add in more steps, you kind of get increasing time, increasing costs, uh, more labor, uh, and more possibility for contamination. And I think so I'm interested to see what Charles Chu's got to say um, uh, the, at the last session because he's worked hard on this kind of problem. But I do want to say that the sequencing singularity is going to depend on getting genomes, not genes, out of clinical samples. Just detecting a pathogen will not be sufficient, particularly because, you know, if you've ever done any of this sort of metagenomic sequencing, the sort of bag of crap at the bottom of your sequencing uh, library has, has all sorts of things in there, all the things you've ever sequenced in your entire career, sort of like an inventory of contamination. And we have this issue about, you know, you take like a short read library and do a sort of very naive taxonomic approach. You know, it takes something like K12, shear it up, and then just do blast of those short reads. This is the sort of profile you get. You know, uh, you, you, you get Escherichia and, and, and Shigella, they're the same thing, it makes sense. But you also get a whole bunch of other um, Enterobacteria ACI taxa. That's really not going to be good enough for, for clinical diagnostics from genomes. We need the whole genome sequence. 
Now, this is where actually microbiology and Koch and Pasteur, maybe they thought about all this in advance, actually, and that's why they invented culture. Because culture is actually quite a good way of addressing a lot of these problems, okay? You can take a, a cultured isolates um, and you can put them into the ligation kit or the rap rapid kit and you can get whole genomes, whole uh, single contigs or a few a few contigs, and critically, for the tracking of antibiotic resistance, you can get whole plasmid sequences out. And this is a, these are genuine results from um, um, a mobile laboratory we set up on an island off the coast of Africa investigating um, an outbreak of cellulitis, and we were able to generate this kind of information from culture. Um, okay, I'm running out of time, but um, uh, what, what, what do all these foods have in common? So, eh? Yeast, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. My, kind of, they're products of microbial fermentation. That's not the right answer. This is what hipsters eat. <laughs> okay, I had to have this slide because we're in New York. So this is what hipsters eat. Um, and um, not only that, they are also extremely useful mock communities for uh, benchmarking, trying to reconstruct um, microbial communities from uh, long reads. So this is what we've been doing, things like our poor camp course and other courses. Um, we've been generating, this is a kind of nice material to work with. And um, just some results here. You know, we can actually take these reasonably simple polymicrobial communities and reconstruct whole genomes, uh, long contigs. Often we get mi misassemblies and we get mixtures and we get longer genomes than we're expecting because strains kind of get ma mashed together. But for things like kimchi and kefir here, we are managing to generate three or four, five decent genome uh, fragments, uh, contigs, um, directly from um, um, these uh, ingredients. And, and we've been playing around with different conditions. But at the moment, we've really uh, got a pretty low uh, N50 uh, compared to where we need to be if we're going to genuinely uh, sort out polymicrobial infections and microbiome samples. So our solution to this, you may have seen this before, is the, is the whale reads, the ultra-long reads. We're defining ultra-long reads as data sets with N50s of greater than 100 KB. And whale watching for a time became an obsession in the lab with Josh. Um, and uh, and uh, we presented these, 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 these uh, results are in a preprint um, looking at the human genome, and uh, Sergey Corin is going to talk about that in more detail in a talk later, and also online on my blog, and uh, protocols for doing ultra-long read sequencing um, using the rapid kit with much more high molecular weight DNA added. And we've recently added an amendment to this protocol which makes it work with RAD3. RAD3 is not working quite as well as RAD2, but it does a reasonable job. Um, on E. coli. Now, I, I am sorry, I'm finishing. Now, um, <laughs> any Americans know what this is? Any Brits or Australians know what this is? Yeah, it's the ashes. Um, this is an urn, this is the trophy that you get if you win uh, the uh, test match between Australia and the UK. And uh, uh, the ashes uh, are supposed to represent the death of British crit cricket. Cricket, for Americans, cricket's like a better version of baseball. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the ashes uh, are the death of British cr cricket um, after a particularly egregious defeat um, in, in the test match between England and Australia uh, in 1882. Now, uh, I put the ashes up here because I thought it would be quite a good gag to present one of these urns um, to uh, Martin, Martin Smith, who recently beat our record. So our longest, our longest read at the, current, at the current time of printing is 950 KB, and I think Martin's recently recorded a 970 KB read. So well done, Martin. <laughs> um, and I thought it'd be a good gag to, to get a replica of this trophy and bring it, but it was 70 quid. I'm not, for a cheap gag, I'm not spending 70 quid. But Gordon has said he'll, he will buy a replica Ashes urn for you, and you can receive it. But then when someone beats that record, which will happen soon, um, you have to, we'll have to get another one. OK, so just to finish, uh, oh, uh, um, we do have a record still. I'm keeping this record. We can do E. coli in a single contig um, from eight reads with our ultra-long data set. Um, that takes 1.5 seconds to assemble using Miniasm on one CPU. Are we looking at the end of assembly as a concept? Can we read right through the E. coli? Not really, that, that's not the goal, but the goal is can we 
trivially complete genomes with these long reads, and can we trivially complete microbiomes, whole microbiomes? That's where I think we're going to need to be for the sequencing singularity. So I'm going to finish there. I didn't really talk about direct RNA sequencing, but that's maybe an important aspect uh, of this idea. Direct RNA diagnosis uh, of pathogens, either uh, targeted or untargeted, that may well have worked with Ebola with those high viral titers. It probably wouldn't have worked with Zika. But I think the other interesting thing is we can get lots of RNA from, from human cells. Can we get a host response um, signature as part of our standard diagnosis? And I think that's a very interesting idea that we want to pursue. So um, we've done some work as part of a collaboration, a consortium on direct RNA, and uh, so, so Mitt and Jane and Winston Timp are going to present that later on, stick around. Too many people to acknowledge, sorry for going over time, uh, but I, thought, I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nick. So we do have um, a question just at the front here, sorry. What do you, what's your view? I'm interested in your, the ultra long read. I mean, how much that sacrifice in terms of the yield? And then is there any way that you think um, that can be um, easily done in, in a very clinical lab? Uh, mm, yeah, uh, two, two, two questions there. One's easier than the other. I think um, you shouldn't have to sacrifice massive um, amounts of yield to do the ultra long reads. We, we can get reliably between two and a half gig and five gig using the rapid kit, whether that's long reads um, or, or regular um, um, uh, ra uh, rapid reads. Um, I think probably there is a ceiling there compared to the ligation kits where people do report 10 to 15 uh, gigs. But actually in our hands, we don't see a like a huge amount of difference there. Maybe a ligation library might give six or seven in our hands and maybe a rapid might typically give three to four. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the question is how can you do high molecular weight, ultra high molecular weight preps in a clinical lab? Um, that's a very good question. Um, at the moment, you know, the, these DNA preps take 24 hours to resuspend, quite typically. So it's not exactly a, it's not a rapid uh, protocol that you could um, easily apply at the moment. Um, I think we're going to need some, um, I think we might need some automation to help to help with this. It may be that we don't need to go to these really crazily long read lengths to get the kind of benefits I'm talking about in terms of polymicrobial infections and, and microbiome. Maybe 50 KB is, is sufficient for that. Um, but yeah, I think we'll need some new techniques in order to um, uh, make that kind of high throughput uh, and easy. Um, at the moment, it's pretty, it's, it's sort of, it's artisanal hipster uh, molecular biology. This is why Josh likes it. But yeah, we need to, uh, we need to change that. We'll take one question from the field. Can your enrichment amplification method be used to detect viruses in the mosquitoes? Uh, yes, it can, definitely. It's actually, there's actually more Zika, for example, in a mosquito than... than uh, it's easier to do it from, from a mosquito than it is from a patient, typical patient sample. And there are, there are... There have been... There is at least one published study um, uh, doing this on mosquitoes using our protocol, I think. Don't quote me. But Dave O'Connor um, in Wisconsin uh, has used our PCR method uh, uh, for this. And, and also Nate Grubau has used this um, on mosquitoes as well. And this is sort of like the st uh, becoming a standard protocol for, for Zika sequencing. Yeah, there's no reason it didn't work in mosquitoes. How important is the accuracy of the reads over the length in, you know, for um, uh, clinical settings? Um, Okay, so you, I guess you mean like read level accuracy. Um, you know, what, what's more important, getting, getting, getting long reads or getting accurate, accurate reads? reads? I think it's, it depends a lot on what you're trying to do. Um, so there's, there's a few different points here. If you want to track plasmids around a hospital, I, I think you need the long reads. You know, to put a, put a plasmid together and, and actually type it and understand w what genes are in the plasmid versus what are in the host and what are in, in both, you need the long reads to be able to do that kind of work. Um, the, the, the nanopore reads are noisy. Um, having said that, at consensus coverage and using a signal level approach like, lang like nanopolish, even at reasonably moderate coverage levels, you can get highly accurate uh, genotyping um, performed with SNPs. Uh, what you can't do at the moment is get every single base uh, perfect de novo, including the indels particularly, 
and that, that's still a gap. And I think um, uh, Ryan Wicks will talk about that later on. Um, and there is a gap there. There's still about 0.1% you know, of accuracy, particularly in the homopolymers, that we can't get at. Clinically, how important is that? I, probably most of the time that's not that important, I would say. You could imagine a situation where an antibiotic resistance gene is it's got an indel and it's been knocked out and therefore it's not resistant where, and you might have predicted it would be resistant from, from the data. So I guess there's those kind of, those kind of issues. But, but I, I think, you know, in terms of detection of genes and in terms of, of doing transmission trees, um, uh, you want both the, the, you know, you want the long reads, um, ideally, um, and you can manage with, with, with the error rate as it is. But I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope we won't have to have that trade-off quite soon. I'm afraid the red light, red light is flashing. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you.